So our next presentation is a uh, joint, uh, has two authors. Um, Hayes Shoup has been a conservator of paintings at the Western Center for the Con Conservation of Fine Arts in Denver, Colorado since 2002 and worked at the Rocky Mountain Conservation Center at the University of Denver beginning in 1988. He holds a BFA from Arizona State University and served an internship in the conservation of easel paintings at the Courtauld um, as a Samuel H. Kress Fellow in 1993 to 94. And Yasuko Ogino owns and operates Mobile Art Conservation Services in Denver, Colorado. She received a BA in art from UCLA in 1992 and an MA uh, certific and certificate in art conservation from the State Buffalo um, program um, in, no, sorry, State, Col State University College at Buffalo in 2000. She has worked for museums, private conservation studios, regional conservation centers, and state-run facilities for historic preservation in California, Colorado, Indiana, Georgia, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania. Yasuko has lived in Denver with her fellow conservator husband and two sons since 2010. <laughs> We are Hayes Shoup of the Western Center for the Conservation of Fine Arts and Yasuko Gino of the Mobile Art Conservation Services in Denver, Colorado. This past May, we traveled to the northernmost part of Alaska for the on-site treatment of six paintings. In this presentation, we'll be using song titles from the movie Frozen to introduce each section, but there will be no actual singing from me, at least. <laughs> so let's break the ice, shall we? Our adventure takes place in Baro, or Uktiavik in the native Inupiat language, 320 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Home to more than 4,500 people, it is only reachable by plane or ship and calls itself the top of the world. At such an exotic locale, you may be picturing a Disney-esque frozen wonderland of sparkling snow, northern lights, and frolicking wildlife. Reality, as usual, is slightly less charming. As we happened to be there during mud season, temperatures hovered around freezing and there was a constant blanket of gray clouds. The only hint of wildlife we saw was a section of whale baleen lying in the road. We were referred to this project by uh, our friend and colleague Scott Carley up there in, in Alaska. And um, it had sort of been in the works for several years. So every once in a while, Carmen would say in a staff meeting, oh, and someone needs to go to Barrow, Alaska, and I'd be going, ooh, <laughs> pick me, because I really did want to see the top of the world. They, uh, they eventually procured their grant monies, and the first trip was in November of 2015, which wouldn't seem like the most opportune time maybe to go there, but uh, I said, bring it on, you know, I want the whole experience. So the temperatures were in the 20 to 30 below zero range during that week. And um, I was there the final day that the sun rose above the horizon. And it wouldn't again until February. So it was mostly dark. And it was uh, at least a half mile trek back and forth from the hotel to the uh, Heritage Center. And I walked that um, in the morning and then in the evening as, it, as they were and uh, because I'd brought all the right gear and I really did want that full experience. The painting that I went to treat on that trip was uh, Hunters of the North. It's a large painting oil on canvas that hangs in the lobby of the Heritage Center. And it's by the artist Lunda Hoyle Gill, painted in 1983, and I believe that it was a gift from an oil company to the Inupiat people. And she is an artist who evidently travels around the world sort of portraying indig indigenous peoples. But in the, in the giant lobby of the Heritage Center there, they've got this uh, whale, uh, cool whale thing suspended on cables. But there's no relative humidity control in that part of the building. And so you can imagine when it's 30 below outside and 70 degrees in there, the sort of uh, problems that that could set up. Um, they do have a control, a, a fully environmentally controlled gallery there that, that's quite beautiful where most of their artifacts are housed. 
There's a lot of flaking and inner layer cleavage on this painting. She executed, executed it with a sort of a thin brush coating of oil paint. And then she went over that with a palette knife and just laid the paint on like it's like frosting on a cake. And, um, and there's really a poor bond between those layers. So if it gets torqued and stressed and strained or anything like that, then it's going to fracture that, that upper, you know, uh, trailed on layer. And so whenever they have to move it, that, that's going to happen. And then the complications of the relative humidity. When I go out on a job like this, I always try to take aqueous materials because you don't know what situation you're going to end up working in. So, um, so I took every aqueous adhesive I could think of and um, aqueous in painting materials and even an aqueous varnish that I found at the, uh, at the art store. And what ended up working was consolidation with the Lasco medium per consolidation, which um, I understand was designed for wall paintings. And I'm not chemist enough to understand what they've done with the surface tension, but man, that stuff goes everywhere. And so what I would do is uh, use a syringe and inject that into the flaking areas and let that sit there for a little while. And then I would take, I was using uh, Kleenex because that was handy, and then wick that adhesive back out of there. Then let that set for a few minutes and then use a tack iron and it really sat down beautifully. But there was so much of it that it took me the whole week to do that and I ended up finishing about two hours before I was due to get on the plane to come home. Um, the, the, whole, uh, the whole treatment worked out uh, really nicely, and, uh, and meanwhile during that week I was doing exams and proposals on the rest of their paintings in their collection um, with the idea that they would be shipped down to Denver to our studios for the treatment. Um, although they kept asking me, are there things that you could do here? And I said, well, um, yeah, some of the treatments could be done back up there. And I didn't really imagine that they would want to bring me all the way back up there again for some more minor treatments. Um, and they do have this beautiful shop there. They call it the Native Room. And it's a facility for, uh, for the uh, Native artists to come in and work. And it's got fume extraction. There's lots of nice equipment. It's a huge space. And so um, there was that possibility in the back of my mind. Um, so a year and a half later, when we were in the process of advising them on how to pack up the paintings, they would need to build a crate for the bigger painting, and the others they could have done in strong boxes. Um, we found out that the uh, transit insurance that they were going to need to fly them down to Denver was going to be um, unexpectedly cost prohibitive <coughs> and it was uh, really going to sink the project and so they said can you come here to do the treatments and there were two linings that were planned and um, when I was at the court the hot table was broken and so people were doing the linings there with vacuum envelopes and I had a long time ago done a big mural project using a vacuum envelope although I had the advantage of the hot table suction system to work with, but I decided that, uh, that we could probably do this. And I assumed we would be working in that native room and uh, not outside and not in the loading dock and not in the collections management rooms. But it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so regarding our 2017 trip, I'll start with some of the logistics. At this time of year, um, it was perpetually light out. Our accommodations were the modern and convenient Tecumovic suites, which were set up like one or two bedroom apartments with all the amenities. There's no lobby or front desk, just a sign posted at the main door warning of polar bears, though sadly we didn't see any. Barrel locals seem to subsist mainly on hunted whale even today. Hayes witnessed this stash of thawing whale meat on the right during his 2015 trip. Luckily for visitors, there are other food options. Restaurants are pretty inconspicuous and tend to offer a little of everything from Chinese to burgers to pizza. The one large grocery store in town is well stocked but very pricey. 
So now that we have the lay of the land, let's get to what we came here for. Do you want to line a painting and treat five others? <laughs> Our home away from Takumavik Suites was the Inupiat Heritage Center, which is a museum and hub for cultural activities. The display and storage areas for the collection of cultural artifacts are sophisticated and the professional staff strives to maintain modern standards of collections care and preservation. The painting circled in the community area is the largest one we will be working on. The painting is uh, called Whale Hunting. It's by Charles Hirlein and the Ola, Olaf here is used for scale. The issues were, uh, I included a tear in the upper right quadrant, um, raised cracks, localized losses, discolored varnish, and grime. Other paintings to be treated were portraits of whaling boat captain Charles Brower and his native-born wife, Asinatak, again, Olaf for scale. These portraits had been adhered to wood panels by the artist himself 19 years after they were painted, as noted in this inscription on the reverse of Mr. Brower. It reads, restored by C. Herlean in 1964 after damaged in Barrow Storm of 1963. As the lining adhesive and supports were in good condition, all of the painting's issues were aesthetic. They were obviously grimy and discolored, but also had a number of localized losses. The remaining paintings to be treated uh, were a portrait of Inupiat whaler Tok Tok, which had surface issues in cupped paint, and two small acrylic paintings which only needed grime removal and minor in-painting. We began with the treatment of the largest painting, and the major part of this treatment was to be structural. After cleaning, the painting was taken off of its strainer, the reverse was cleaned, and a Dartek envelope was constructed for overall humidity treatment. And uh, I knew we were gonna be using an iron on, on this uh, a vacuum envelope and so the Dartek could stand up to that heat. Uh, the envelope was constructed for overall humidity treatment and I had previously sent many of the materials ahead of our arrival in anticipation of humidification and lining. By the way, any supplies we couldn't send ahead or carry on the plane we were bought at an Ace Hardware store which opened between the time I was there in 2015 and, and, uh, and this trip. And it is literally the only national retail chain store in the entire area. For the humidity treatment of whale hunting, the painting was placed in the Dartek envelope with a moistened sheet of fiberglass fabric and rope breathers leading to an opening in the lower left corner which we rigged with the uh, shop back hose. While humidifying under vacuum, areas of cupped paint were worked down with a hand iron with constant monitoring using, and using an infrared thermometer. On the other side of the room, aqueous cleaning of the other paintings was taking place. We break here to share a miracle that had occurred at this point of our adventure. One day of glorious sunshine it was hard not to abandon the workroom and enjoy the rays, but there was still much work to be done and hurdles to be jumped. Love is an open loading dock door. The biggest logistical hurdle by far was the extreme sensitivity of museum staff to any solvent stronger than plain water. Even opening a jar of aquazol in ethanol caused a panic. People in the administrative wing at the other end of the building were literally being taken to the hospital or staying home entirely because of toxic fumes. <laughs> For anything requiring solvents, we were relegated to the loading dock with the door partially open when it was snowing outside, or we were completely outside for things such as Biva infusion of the large painting. After infusing the reverse of whale hunting, the painting was hand-lined to acrylic fabric which had been sized with Biva D8 uh, before I shipped it up there with a, uh, fiberglass, a woven fiberglass interleaf which had been sized with Roplex for uh, stiffening. Again, using the IR thermometer to gauge the heat. A stiff lining fabric was used in order to hold down the cupped paint as much as possible. The painting was then attached to a new custom-made keyable stretcher which had been flown in 
and it was brushed with MS-2A, outdoors of course. It was filled with modestuck and in painted with the Gamlin conservation colors. You know, and we mentioned there are no roads in and out of, of Barrow, but they do in the wintertime go plow a road out on the frozen ocean, and then they can get down to like Prudhoe Bay, down to where some shipping ports are. Um, meanwhile, on the other paintings, Tok Tuk had his own humidity treatment in a vacuum bag, and <coughs> here is Mr. Brower set up on a makeshift easel for in-painting. There comes a time in every treatment where one must call it finished. So this is uh, whale hunting before and after the treatment, and the reverse, and the uh, details of the losses, the cupped paint, and the tear. This is Mr. Brower during and after treatment. Mrs. Brower. Tuck, tuck. And the two acrylic paintings. On our last day in Barrow, we were treated to a driving tour of the area by collections manager, Diana Martin. Uh, she took us to the northernmost point of the U.S., Point Barrow. We saw the locally famous Brower Family Cafe, which could be seen in the background of the portrait of Mrs. Brower. <coughs> we also tried on modern versions of the traditional Inupiat winter coat made by Diana herself. Then it was time to go home. We all know reindeers are better than people. Whoops. Sorry. Did you see the menu? Did you see the menu there? <laughs> but these are the people we'd like to thank for making this project possible. Conservator Scott Carley, Akamak, Diana, and Paul of the Inupiat Heritage Center, as well as Carmen Bria and Nancy Gerbala of the Western Center for the Conservation of Fine Arts. And the people at home who held down the fort for our eight-day absence. We leave you with some parting scenes on our way out of Barrow to Anchorage and back to Denver. Thank you for listening. Thank you for reminding us of what it can be like. Um, does I, we have time for a few questions? If anybody has any. We're all speechless. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I will add one more thing. We. Uh, I had been trying to arrange for us to see a polar bear up there. I mean, <laughs> I really wanted to do that. And <clears throat> it was whaling season, and so they were going to take us out on snowmobiles out to where they were butchering a whale because the polar bears hang out there until they're done and they leave. And, uh, and so we had that in the works, and then Akamak ended up getting sick and needing to go to the hospital down in Anchorage, and she was the one making the arrangements, so we didn't get to see it. But. You, you guys didn't Next tell me you took a day off when the sun <laughs> came out. I don't, I don't feel so bad now, okay? <laughs> For a non-conservation related question, uh, did you try muktuk and what is your impression of it? <laughs> I, I did try muktuk and I declared it inedible. I, mean, I don't understand that at all. It's like chewing on a piece of gristle off of a steak. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.